what's the script about and uh, a script that was used probably 2000, 2300 years back. How did this script came to be deciphered? Because by the time people start taking proper notice of the script, it's become illegible for anybody in India or anybody in the world. So how did the how did it get deciphered? Is what I'm going to be talking about. It's, it's an interesting story. I'll tell you what Ram is all about. Um, so it's important to understand the terms prehistory and history. So historians typically classify the entire history into these two halves. Prehistory is a period beyond which you don't have any written material, or the writing system was not there. Okay. So that's that period is called prehistory. History is when the historical period is when you have some interpretation. So you could have inscriptions, manuscripts, or some symbols being used to depict uh, something. Right? So that's the difference situation between prehistory and history. Why is writing so important? Uh, it's one of the important cultural markers for any civilization. So how we have the second language culture uh, uh, or the invention of a language for communication. So the invention of script is equally important. It's an important cultural marker if you want to understand how a civilization has progressed. Uh, because when you have written material, your knowledge is no more stuck in space and time. You could write it, document it, spread it over a period, period of time. In fact, that's how we got to know a lot about 2,200 years old history through the inscriptions that are written over that time. Uh, so that's the difference between history and prehistory. The case of India is a bit different. Uh, like I said, we have got the English value period. So beyond this, we have no written material. There's absolutely no evidence of writing until the English value period. But it's during the English value period, we have for, for the first time some script being written on seeds. So how do we know that these are seeds? These, these are hardly like one and a half centimeter to two centimeter squares. Okay. So how do we know that these are seeds? Uh, because if you turn around, uh, the back you have a small, uh, uh, what do you call that? It's, it's like a hook. So you could pass thread around it and then uh, you could use that to stamp on clay tablets to create an impression of what's written on that. Uh, so it's during this period, in all the thousand sites that I've been talking about, wherever you go excavate, you find these seeds. So for, for about a period of 1000 to 1200 years, you have these uh, seeds found across the country. Across the industrial civilization. Okay? Uh, there's also a signboard in the site called Dolavira in uh, Gujarat. Uh, but that's the only place where this script is written other than on the sea. Right? In everywhere else, you just find them on sea, but only in Dolavira. On a gate, you see a script uh, in this form. Uh, so, but this script is still undecipherable. Nobody knows what this means to this day. Uh, so we have a peculiar period in Indian history where you know that a writing system existed but you don't know what it means. And so historians have to invent a new word, so they call it a proto-history. So we have the pre-history, proto-history and again let's say from modern period is where you start to have first written material. So, uh, but between this period we have absolutely no clue. There's no written evidence there's no written material that we get for about a thousand odd years. It's really like fascinating uh, as to what happened to the system of writing. Uh, can you next slide? So, let me just talk about this is the proto history. Then we have the history, historical period starting from uh, modern era. So, the next question you would ask is what's the earliest evidence of writing in India? Right? So, or in other words, what's the oldest deciphered script in India? We know that in this script, in this script we, we have no clue about it. Right? Uh, luckily, uh, so Egyptian civilization and the Mesopotamian civilization were contemporaries to Indus Valley civilization. How do we know that? The Indus seals that we found across thousand odd sites in uh, these Indus Valley sites, the, the very similar seals were found in Mesopotamia. So which means the historians then correlate that there is some form of a trade that is happening and uh, and they also know that the Mesopotamian civilization was a contemporary to Indus Valley civilization. Uh, in fact, there is no way to date Indus, uh, Indus period until the arrival of carbon dating, but they know the dates of Mesopotamian civilization and they know that Indus period is contemporary. So that's how we started the first date in Indus Valley period. 
later obviously we are carbon dating to better understand what's the period uh, about the, of the civilization. So like you're saying, the Egyptian civilization and Mesopotamian civilization, even they had a writing system. Egyptians had hieroglyphics, uh, the Mesopotamians had cuneiform script. Uh, they were also not known when like modern historians looked at it. Uh, but they are lucky because uh, in Egypt they found Rosetta Stone. Uh, it was the French who first find this and bring it to the popular Western movies. Uh, eventually the British looted it from French and now it's lying in the British Museum in London. Uh, in London. Um, so Rosetta Stone is, is important because it's got the heliographics and uh, it's also got the same, same stuff written in Greek. So because it's a bilingual inscription, people decipher like what was there in the heliographics. It's not as simple as I say, but it was a significant of effort to decrypt the heliographics. Mesopotamian civilization is a similar thing. There was an inscription called Behustan inscription, which had the which was again a multilingual inscription. It had the cuneiform script and also the other language, other script that was known. Uh, so they figured out the cuneiform script. But for in this period, we have we couldn't find any such bilingual inscription. Which is like a still remain uh, enigma to the scholars. Obviously. There are lots of people trying to use different methods to decrypt it, uh, but that's the story. So, in this period, we don't know what the script is, but the latest evidence, but the oldest decipher script that we know of is the Brahman. Yeah? Uh, at this point, I just want to bring to your notice it's a common misconception uh, that script is what you call the language. Right? So, uh, this is all no one's script. It's written in English. Uh, so script is like uh, script is just the symbols. Uh, yeah, language is language. Okay. Uh, so Brahmi is the oldest decipher script that we know of today that can be read. Uh, but the language very clearly you know is Sanskrit. Archaic Sanskrit was being used to compose Vedas. So there's no sense in comparing Sanskrit and Brahmi. It's an apples and oranges. So it's not confusing about that. Uh, but we have the oldest script that we know of is Brahmi. Uh, so where do we see the first? Uh, so if you, if you go to New Delhi, uh, the National Museum, there's a gallery called Evolution of Indian Scripts and Coins Gallery. So it's a fantastic gallery, you should visit it. It talks about uh, how it's got 26 panels of how every other character in Brahmi alphabet has modified from the modern period up to the latest, uh, up to the modern scripts that we know of. Okay, so you have got Brahmi, Tel Telugu, Kannada, Tamil, right? All, all the modern language, uh, Indian scripts are derived from Brahmi. So for every character in Brahmi, you will see a panel. This is, for example, for A. This is A in Brahmi, and uh, this is where, like, this is what, these are the modern scripts that we used to. Uh, so to do visit this, uh, if you go to the National Museum, visit this gallery. So we talk about how Brahmi has evolved over a period of time. So where do we see the earliest evidence of writing in Brahmi? So this is from Ashoka's period. Ashoka as an emperor was the first to put these, uh, I don't know, you could, uh, I can't say in its early name that the Ashoka was the one who employed Brahmi to its fullest extent because his pillars, the pillar edicts, which are found across the country, right into Karnataka, you've got a place called Maski, in Rancho district, where you will see Ashokan uh, rock edict. Uh, so, two places in Kanda, to Afghanistan and Pakistan, we've got Ashoka himself. And they are all written in Brahmi or Karushi scripts. Uh, so, if a script was so popular by his time, people could read it. That means the script had already been in use. It's just that we don't have material to look at how the script was used. So uh, the first written material that we have of Brahmi usage, these are Ashoka papers. Okay. Uh, briefly about Ashoka, uh, you know that he is uh, uh, from the Mauryan dynasty, son of Bindusara, is Rudi Pujain as a governor. Then after Bindusara dies, he goes to become the emperor, fights the Kalinga war, and then turns into a Buddhist, starts to spread Buddhism beyond. Sends his son and daughter to Sri Lanka, uh, and that's how Buddhism spreads. Uh, so, all this rock edits is where he's giving his gyan, he's giving, he's talking about Dhamma, uh, teaching about Buddhism, 
talking about the local practices, and, uh, wise things that humans should be doing. Uh, also, the lots of commands that he's giving to his uh, governors, uh, to other administrators, and how to rule. So that's what is uh, Ashoka's on the edX uh, rocket. He's got uh, these inscriptions on rocks, on uh, pillars, there are minor rocket X. Uh, so that's where we see for the first time Brahmi being written. Okay. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah. So you said that Brahmi was just a script and not a language. Right? So which language was this map to back then? Fantastic question. So uh, it was written in the Prakrit. The language was Prakrit. It was not something. So which were the other languages that it was also used? Fantastic question. Pali. So uh, Pali. Uh, Pali. I have Tamil as well. Uh, in Tamil, I don't know. I don't know if uh, Ashoka inscriptions are. Oh, no, Ashoka inscriptions. Okay, yeah, Brahmi. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a variant of Brahmi called Tamil Brahmi. So there are lots of pottery in Tamil Nadu, uh, on which there are uh, very brief words in it. It's uh, Tamil Brahmi, is what they call it. Slight variant of Brahmi. So that was also there. Then you have a Patti to a site in Andhra. Uh, it's a place of uh, uh, importance to Buddhists. They've got a stupa, which is now in it's not in good condition, it's a Buddhist stupa. Uh, so the Bhatti Prodi inscriptions also are also in the Brahmi screen. Uh, I don't know what the language is in Bhatti Prodi. Uh, so by the way, uh, Ashoka's inscriptions are also in uh, Karoshti script, I must tell you that. So Karoshti was a contemporary of Brahmi script. Uh, it was mostly used in the northwestern part of the country. So it's not popular in India. Uh, it was also, Ashoka's inscriptions are also in Greek. So there's some places where it is written in Greek as well. So the Greek alphabet is very much by the side. Yes, yes, yes. Greek was there. Because uh, by Chandrakuta period, there was already, the, the Greeks' interaction was there with Indians. So there, there was a there was Greek being used during that time. So when Karushti was used to what language? Prakrit. Prakrit. Yeah, Prakrit. So what did that evolve into? What did Karoshti evolve into? Fantastic question. Fantastic question. So Karoshti did not, actually we don't see much evolution from Karoshti. Okay. It's, it's really interesting. Like if two contemporary scripts, Karoshti dies eventually. But Brahmi is the mother of all the scripts in modern India. So not just India, all the Tibetan scripts and Eastern Asian scripts, they all evolved from Brahmi. Those 64 scripts that are being in used in India and other countries in, uh, in the world now, all evolved from Brahmi. It's really fantastic, like how just one script evolves and Karushti eventually dies. Yes, including Devnagri, exactly. The Devnagri, Modi script, which is used for writing Marathi. Uh, the, the, in, there are lots of intermediate scripts, Siddhamatrika. Uh, I can't uh, quickly remember the script. There are hundreds of variants. During, it just evolves over a period of time. I am going to talk about that. Uh, so, we have this Brahmi script. The next question is when did Brahmi become illegible? Right? When did people start using this way to read Brahmi script? Uh, I can't tell you with certainty when it became illegible. Uh, but what happens is the script takes lots of regional variations. And it also changes its character because you have a different way of writing things. Uh, it's not that you are just inscribing these on rocks. You would have manuscripts and you would have different kinds of pens and papers, uh, papers equivalents. Uh, so people, there would be stylistics and there was lots of evolution of the script. So eventually, Brahmi takes several forms, but there is an interesting story from the Ferashatukla period, which is uh, this period. Ferashatukla was ruling, ruling in Delhi during that time. Uh, so there is a, if you go to uh, Ferashatukla in Delhi, uh, there is a hunting palace of Ferusha. Uh, on that you will see Ashoka building. This is Ashoka building, both of them. It's, it's, uh, during British period, it was called the Lat of Ferusha. Lat meaning pillar. So today it's called the Delhi Topra pillar. I tell you why it's called that way. So <coughs> Ferusha formed this pillar in a place called Tharya, in a place in, in a small village in Tharya. Uh, so basically that Topra is that. So Topra is a small village in Haryana. Uh, so lots of Ashoka uh, pillar and pillars get moved around. And, and there are lots of interesting stories of the aftermath of monuments. Uh, so that, uh, this pillar which was in Haryana is moved to Delhi by Firashan because he's fascinated by this pillar. So there's an interesting story. Uh, I just read it out. 
So in Purusha, first are this uh, pillar. I believe this out. Ancient artifacts and monuments often have interesting life, later life histories. The two Ashokan pillars that stand today in Delhi are a good example. One is a Delhi Topra inscription pillar and the other one is Delhi Meerat pillar. Because that pillar was originally in Meerat, it was eventually moved to Delhi. So, the 14th century Tarikir Feroz Shah, <coughs> because this is a uh, uh, history of Feroz Shah written during the 14th century uh, by Shams Siraj Afif, he gives an account of the columns today known as the Delhi Topra and Delhi Mirror Pillars. Afif tells us that Sultan Feroz Shah Tughlaq noticed the pillars in Topra uh, in modern day Haryana and in Mirror in modern day UP. In the course of his military campaigns, and that he was so impressed by them that he decided to transport them to Delhi. Afif describes the moving of the Topra pillar as follows. Orders were issued to the people living in and around Topra village and to soldiers, direct them, directing them to assemble at the pillar and to bring along with them various tools and lots of silk cotton and silk cotton tree. When the earth around the column had been carefully removed, the pillar fell on the bed of the silk cotton that had been prepared for it. The pillar was encased in reeds and heights and carefully moved onto a specially made carriage with 42 wheels. Men pulled all the ropes attached to the wheels and the cart was dragged to the Yamuna. And the cart uh, where the Sultan appeared personally uh, to direct further operations. The pillar was heaved on to several boats tied together and taken by river to its new home in Delhi. At Feroz Shah Bar, which is the Feroz Shah Kotla, it was hoisted on to its present position in the palace complex with great ingenuity, skill and labour. Nobody could read the Ashokan Brahmi by this time. Okay, by the 14th century, it had already become religion. But Afif tells us that some Brahmanas were claimed, some, some Brahmins claimed that they could read. Okay, so they were allowed, they were bought by the emperor. Yeah, you, you ask them to read what is there. They announced that the inscription contained a prophecy that no one would be able to remove the pillar from its original place till the time of a great king named Sultan Firuz. <laughs> so uh, everything, they are just laughing around. <laughs> so that's, well, that's not what is written on the pillar again. <laughs> so by Firuz period, nobody knew Brahma's script. Well, this is a painting from the man's script. That's how they moved the pillar. Usually all Ashoka's pillars have a capital. It could be lion, bull, uh, or the four lion capital that we are using. Uh, elephant was also there, horse was there. So, but then you would see that the capital is already broken. It's, it's, it's much defaced. Uh, the interesting story of this is, on the very same pillar inscription, you have another Chahamana king uh, called Vikraha Raja. He also uses the very same pillar to inscribe his own achievements. So you would see this recurring in lots of Ashokan pillars.